I came to the skeptical community in real hope of finding some answers and some support with a real issue that I and millions of other people have, and that is the psychiatric industry and particularly the corrupting influences of Big Pharma on research, diagnosis, treatment, and prescription. Big Pharma has a great deal of money swaying and influencing the argument and invading all sorts of communities. They're sending agents onto the Native American reservation to find potential customers for their medication. Of course, the medication will be paid for at taxpayer expense. They want to pre-screen pregnant women and diagnose them and medicate them while pregnant with drugs that have not been tested on embryos and fetuses, nor on infants. Within the foster care system, young children are being prescribed antipsychotic medication. Again, there's been no study on the effects on children, and the effects on adults decrease lifespan by an average of 25 years. This is completely a for-profit motive. It has nothing to do with people actually needing these medications. In fact, there are more effective treatments than medication for a lot of these diagnoses. So I came to the skeptical community, and what do I hear? Epithets about people with mental health disabilities, behavioral health disabilities, intellectual challenges. I see absolutely no interest in or commitment to skeptical thinking about the sciences. If a scientist says something is true, then it is true. That's scientism. That's not skepticism. So where can I go for information? Because my alternatives are groups that are well-meaning, peer support group, but who are involved at times in woo. Alternative medicines, bogus therapies that I can't endorse, nor do I think are effective, and which I think could possibly be destructive. I know that there are solid alternatives to medical model treatment of mental health issues. But it's very difficult for me to find any support. The community of psychiatric survivors, they have very limited education for the most part, very few options. Most of us live in poverty. We can't do the research. We don't. We can't match the funding of Big Pharma. There's the new age people who blame us for having mental health conditions and say it's our karma. Then there are the people who advocate for ending stigma of mental illness. In the case of Mental Health America, which is the largest in the United States, most of their funding comes from the pharmaceutical companies. They are lobbying in behalf of creating more diagnoses and getting more drugs to more people on behalf of big pharma. So who's actually doing some serious research and skeptical critical thinking about psychiatry. CCHR, Citizens Commission on Human Rights, sounds like a great thing. Stop the overdiagnosing of children and adults. Utilize the more effective and often peer-supported non-medical behavior modification models that are out there that are viable and that do work. But who are they? They're a branch of Scientology. I refer to them. I would never, ever direct somebody to their article, but they cite their sources. So I can take people to the sources that prove that what they're saying is verifiable by a decent news outlet who is citing medical journals and science journals, peer-reviewed. So I came to you, skeptical community, hoping that you would help me to build a body of evidence so that we aren't stigmatized, so that we aren't abused and exploited and over-medicated, and you laugh at me and mock me, not just me, all of us. I have no scientific background and no scientific training, but I will do as much as I can on my own. But we need to question the medical model at the very fundaments of its roots. It's not doing hard science anymore. It's not doing accurate science anymore. One in four people suffer from some sort of mental illness. This is a commonly stated fact within the mental health awareness atmosphere. It becomes increasingly more prevalent as pharmaceutical companies educate people to the so-called benefits of their products. Since most of the published information is coming from pharmaceutical companies, it's extremely difficult to locate any information that might possibly refute this. I'm not disputing it. It is probably true. But in that cluster, they're also including such things as the so-called disorders, which require absolutely no medical verification, such as blood tests, but only require diagnosis by a qualified medical professional. I am uh, w one of the one in four.
Ms. Wax is a professional comedian. She portrays herself as a plucky survivor, which is a real problem within the disability community, particularly within mental health, because the portrayal tends to downplay the actual terror surviving mental health challenges. I edited this out because I consider it practicing medicine without a license. She is dependent on three drugs that she mentions by brand name for the fact that she is standing upright. I, I took to my bed for about a month, and when I woke up, I found I was institutionalized. Well, I wasn't sent a lot of cards or flowers. I mean, if I had had a broken leg or I was with a child, I would have been inundated. But all I got was a couple phone calls telling me to perk up. Perk up. Because I didn't think of that. Uh, one thing that you get with this disease, this one comes with the package, is you get a real sense of shame. Because your friends go, oh, come on, show me the lump, show me the x-rays, and of course you got nothing to show. So you're like really disgusted with yourself because you're thinking, I'm not being carpet bombed, I don't live in a township. So you start to hear these abusive voices, but you don't hear one ab abusive voice. You hear about a thousand abusive, a hundred thousand abusive voices. You know that when you have those abusive voices, all those little neurons get together, and in that little gap you get a real toxic, I want to kill myself kind of chemical. And if you have that over and over again on a loop tape, you might have yourself depression. Oh, and that's not even the tip of the iceberg. If you get a little baby and you abuse it verbally, its little brain sends out chemicals that are so destructive that the little part of its brain that can tell good from bad just doesn't grow. So you might have yourself a homegrown psychotic. If a soldier sees his friend blown up, his brain goes into such high alarm that he can't actually put the experience into words, so he just feels the horror over and over again. So here's my question. My question is, how come when people have mental damage, it's always an act of imagination? How come every other organ in your body can get sick and you get sympathy except the brain? Uh, this little baby has a lot of horsepower. It uh, com comes completely conscious. It's got state-of-the-art lobe. It's filled with a hundred billion neurons just zizzing away, electrically transmitting information. Uh, For every one, one single neuron, you can actually have from 10,000 to 100,000 different connections or dendrites or wh whatever you want to call it. And every time you learn something or you have an experience, that bush grows, you know, that bush of information. Can you imagine every human being is carrying that equipment? Got some bad news. Uh, this isn't for the one in four, this is for the four in four. Uh, we are not equipped for the 21st century. Evolution did not prepare us for this. We just don't have the bandwidth. And for people who say, oh, they're having a nice day, they're perfectly fine, they're more insane than the rest of us. Because I'll show you where there might be a few glitches in evolution. Okay, let me just explain this to you. When we were ancient man, <laughs> millions of years ago, uh, and uh, we suddenly felt threatened by a predator, okay? Uh, we would fill up with our own adrenaline and our own cortisol, and then we'd kill or be killed, we'd eat or we'd be eaten, and then suddenly we'd defuel and we'd go back to normal. Okay, so the problem is nowadays with modern man, <laughs> When we feel in danger, we still fill up with our own chemical, but because we can't kill a traffic wardens <laughs> or eat estate agents, the fuel just stays in our body over and over, so we're in a constant state of alarm, constant state. And here's another thing that happened. About 150,000 years ago, when language came online, we started to put words to this constant emergency. So it wasn't just, oh my God, there's a saber-toothed tiger, which could be. It was suddenly, oh my God, I didn't send the email. Oh my God, my thighs are too fat. Oh my God, everybody can see I'm stupid. I didn't get invited to the Christmas party. So you got this nagging loop tape that goes, over and over again that drives you insane. So you see what, what the problem is? What once made you safe now drives you insane. I, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but somebody has to be. Your pets are happier than you are. <laughs> but my point is, if we don't talk about this stuff and we don't learn how to deal with our lives, it's not gonna be one in four. It's gonna be four in four who are really, really gonna get ill in the upstairs department. And while we're at it, can we please stop the stigma? Thank you. In the academic literature, we will see a biased sample of the true picture of all of the scientific studies that have been conducted. Freaks get published.
People will do lots and lots and lots of different studies, and the occasions when it works, they will publish, and the ones where it doesn't work, they won't. And their first recommendation of how to fix this problem, problem is to make it easier to publish negative results in science and to change the incentives so that scientists are encouraged to post more of their negative results in public. So in 1980, some researchers did a study on a drug called lorcanide, and this was an antiarrhythmic drug. Early on in its development, they did a very small trial, just under 100 patients. 50 patients got lorcanide, and of those patients, 10 died. Another 50 patients got a dummy placebo sugar pill with no active ingredient, and only one of them died. So they rightly regarded this drug as a failure, and its commercial development was stopped. And because its commercial development was stopped, this trial was never published. Other companies had the same idea. These drugs were brought to market. They were prescribed very widely because heart attacks are a very common thing. And it took so long for us to find out that these drugs also caused an increased rate of death that before we detected that safety signal, over 100,000 people died unnecessarily in America from the prescription of antiarrhythmic drugs. The researchers who did that 1980 study, that early study, published a mea culta the scientific community in which they said, when we carried out our study in 1980, we thought that the increased death rate that occurred in the lorcanide group was an effect of chance. The development of lorcanide was abandoned for commercial reasons and this study was never published. It's now a good example of publication bias. And they say the results described here might have provided an early warning of trouble ahead. But this problem, of negative results that go missing in action is still very prevalent, that it cuts to the core of evidence-based medicine. So this is a drug called reboxetine, and this is a drug that I myself have prescribed. It's an antidepressant. And I'm a very nerdy doctor, so I read all of the studies that I could on this drug. I read the one study that was published that showed that reboxetine was better than placebo, and I read the other three studies that were published that showed that reboxetine was just as good as any other antidepressant. But I was misled. In fact, seven trials were conducted comparing reboxetine against a dummy placebo sugar pill. One of them was positive, and that was published, but six of them were negative, and they were left unpublished. Three trials were published comparing reboxetine against other antidepressants, in which reboxetine was just as good, and they were published, but three times as many patients' worth of data was collected, which showed that reboxetine was worse than those other treatments, and those trials were not published. But it turns out that this phenomenon of publication bias has actually been very, very well studied. So here is one example of how you approach it. The classic model is you get a bunch of studies where you know that they've been conducted and completed, and then you go and see if they've been published anywhere in the academic literature. So this took all of the trials that had ever been conducted on antidepressants that were approved over a 15-year period by the FDA. They took all of the trials which were submitted to the FDA as part of the approval package. So that's not all of the trials that were ever conducted on these drugs, because we can never know if we have those, but it is the ones that were conducted in order to get the marketing authorization. And then they went to see if these trials had been published in the peer-reviewed academic literature. And this is what they found. It was pretty much a 50-50 split. Half of these trials were positive, half of them were negative, in reality. But when they went to look for these trials in the peer-reviewed academic literature, what they found was a very different picture. Only three of the negative trials were published, but all but one of the positive trials were published. Now, if we just flick back and forth between those two, you can see what a staggering difference there was between reality and what doctors, patients, commissioners of health services, and academics were able to see in the peer-reviewed academic literature. We were misled. And this is a systematic flaw in the core of medicine. In fact, there have been so many studies conducted on publication bias now, over 100 that they've been collected in a systematic review, published in 2010, that took every single study on publication the bias that they could find. Publication bias affects every field of medicine. About half of all trials, on average, go missing in action. And we know that positive findings are around twice as likely to be published as negative findings. But this is exactly what we blindly tolerate in the whole of evidence-based medicine. And to me, this is research misconduct. If I conducted one study and I withheld half of the data points from that one study, you would rightly accuse me, essentially, of research fraud. And yet, for some reason, if somebody conducts 10 studies, but only publishes the five that give the result that they want, we don't consider that to be research misconduct. 
And when that responsibility is diffused between a whole network of researchers, academics, industry sponsors, journal editors, for some reason we find it more acceptable. But the effect on patients is damning. But we've had to suffer fake fixes. We've had people pretend that this is a problem that's been fixed. First of all, we had trials registers. And everybody said, oh, it's okay. We'll get everyone to register their trials. We'll, they'll post the protocol. They'll say what they're going to do before they do it. And then afterwards, we'll be able to check and see if all the trials which have been conducted and completed have been published. But people didn't bother to use those registers. And so then the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors came along. Well, and they said, oh, we won't publish any trials unless they've been registered before they began. But they didn't hold the line. In 2008, a study was conducted which showed that half of all the trials published by journals edited by members of the ICMJE weren't properly registered, and a quarter of them weren't registered at all. And then finally, the FDA Amendment Act was passed a couple of years ago saying that everybody who conducts a trial must post the results of that trial within one year. And in the BMJ, in the first edition of January 2012, you can see a study which looks to see if people kept to that ruling, and it turns out that only one in five have done so. This is a disaster. We need to force people to publish all trials conducted in humans, including the older trials, because the FDA Amendment Act only asks that you publish the trials conducted after 2008, and I don't know what world it is in which we're only practicing medicine on the basis of trials that completed in the past two years. We need to publish all trials in humans, including the older trials, for all drugs in current use. And you need to tell everyone you know that this is a problem and that it has not been fixed.